if you'd said to me this time last year, oh, Valentine's Day, you're going to be, like, 34 weeks pregnant, I'd be like, shut up. But if you said to me it would have been with a gay Japanese man, I'd have been like, I beg your pardon. <laughs> would you get pregnant for someone else and agree to give the baby away? I'm 26 years old and I'm having a baby for my boss. Across Britain, the number of young women choosing to have other people's babies is rising. Mm -hmm. If you take the mm -hmm. risk to get pregnant, mm -hmm. you've got to take what's coming, haven't you? In most countries in Europe, surrogacy is banned, but in Britain it's legal, as long as you do it for free. People are like, what? How could you do that without getting paid for it? The demand for fertile women is so high that there are now apps and agencies connecting surrogates with people desperate to have children. I think it's probably the biggest decision that you could possibly make. In this series, we follow five of these extraordinary women as they face the emotional sacrifices. Nothing there. It's quite a lot of putting a brave face on. <laughs> and physical dangers. I could die during this pregnancy. Of having someone else's baby. There is no doubt that I am officially addicted to surrogacy. <laughs> This is my makeshift Sharps box of all the injections that I've used so far. These are hormones that make my womb lining thicker. If I actually get it into a bit of fat, that's fine. The selling point of me is that I'm very fertile. Caitlin is preparing her body to carry a baby for another woman. Having a family is the most important thing in the world to me. If you are choosing somebody to have your baby, then you want to choose the best possible attribute. A young, fleshy womb, which is what Caitlin has. Kate has created an embryo with her egg and her partner's sperm. Do you get some milk? Yes. It's due to be put in Caitlin's womb in two weeks' time. Should I do porridge like we did yesterday with the honey and banana? Yes. Okay. If someone needed something and you were in a position to give it to them, you would. Surrogacy was never on my radar before because I didn't know anyone that needed it. But now that I do, it feels like something I should do. Kate and Caitlin both live on Alderney in the Channel Islands and first met at work 18 months ago. Kate is my boss. It's become a bit of a running joke in the office that I'm trying too hard to be the favourite. Good morning. 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 We do the baby website that covers everything from trying to get pregnant through pregnancy, to having a newborn, obviously. I've had three pregnancies that haven't made it to the end. I remember the first um, baby that we lost, obviously, I'd just been shopping for maternity clothes, so then to come back to work and be looking for maternity clothes for other people, that's, that's quite a difficult pill to swallow. Oldney's a really difficult place because you do get little cliques and little groups and things like that, and we, you know, we're a completely different age. We were in completely different sort of groups, so when you come into the office, the only thing you know of each other is sort of what you've heard. I unfortunately knew her as the lady that had lost the babies. I worried that the fact that I already had children, that she would feel... I don't know if jealousy is the right word, but kind of like it was difficult. I felt really conscious, like I couldn't... I didn't want to bring up my children in the office. So as soon as I realised that there was something that I could maybe do to help, I suppose I guess I jumped on that a little bit. I was like, oh, I don't have to be the bad guy, I can be the good guy. <laughs> I don't need to feel like you have to rent out your womb just so you can talk <laughs> about your amazing children. You have a good day. Mummy, what's your favourite cake? What's your favourite cake? Emma is 12 weeks pregnant with a baby she's having for a couple called Kevin and Aki. She's a full-time mum to her two-year-old son, Jacob. How did you meet Kevin and Aki? I met them through an app. Um, it's kind of like a Tinder, almost. 
Mission Log has swiped the wrong way. <laughs> this app is basically the missing puzzle piece for couples and fertility and stuff like that. Whatever you're looking for, that someone will have it somewhere in the country. So some of these will be people looking for surrogate. So it might be some like gay couples, it might be heterosexual couples. And you get a lot of people on there who are sperm donors and they're like, okay, by the way, I only do inseminations via like the home, like natural method. And you're like, great, well, I'm not really after that, but thank you very much. So Kevin Naki, on my second day, we actually matched with each other and we got talking. I think it was love at first sight when we first met Emma. I think it's like when you turn up to a date and you think, God, this is a mismatch. They could do so much better than me. We were looking for a surrogate for three years. We did think, is there something about us that we're not being picked? We are incredibly lucky to have not only found a surrogate and match, to have found Emma to be pregnant. Yeah, Kevin Naki for me are the picture of stability. They're a couple that's very much got it together. <laughs> you know, they're, they're married. They've been together for such a long time now. Hello. Hello. They're ready for that child. Unlike Caitlin, Emma is using her own egg to make a baby for intended parents, Kevin and Aki. Oh, it's official now, isn't it? Definitely pregnant yes. than that. <laughs> oh we did artificial insemination. So Aki did his business into a pot, got a syringe and popped it up there. Uh, I did bring myself to orgasm because that helps pull the sperm up there to help the chances of conception. That could really, oh my God. Mm. Seems dark, isn't it? It starts bitter, and then you actually, like, it explodes in your mouth. Oh my God, that's amazing. We're very lucky. It worked the first time. Two weeks later, I was pregnant. <laughs> it's alcohol oh free. <laughs> <laughs> Just so we're clear. Although Emma doesn't intend to keep the baby, it will biologically be hers. I think when you're a surrogate, you kind of go into it with a certain mindset. You've known from the beginning it's not your baby. Squishy. Squish, squishy, squishy. <laughs> In terms of my egg, I don't feel like I'm necessarily giving away something personal, which sounds silly because it's my egg. I create loads of eggs every month. So what's one egg to help someone, really? I know it's not my baby in that connection sense. I don't feel like I'm handing it over. I'm just giving it back to its original parents, I suppose. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, yeah. Thank you. It doesn't affect me in a bonding kind of maternal way. I have moments where I've watched some TV shows, so like some The Handmaid's Tale, and where she's so connected to the baby, you think, oh my goodness, but what if that does happen? But then you think, but it's not going to, so you don't need to panic yourself. You know it won't. Can you march like a soldier? Can you jump like a frog? <laughs> it's one week until Caitlin is due to have her manager Kate's embryo transferred into her womb. Oh my goodness, he's vanished again! Oh. Up, look, we, light. Yeah, so those five words have to go in these five sentences. Caitlin already has two children. Imogen and Max. She split up with their dad two years ago. She's now in a new relationship. Can you make cake? Jordan, so my boyfriend. We've been together about a year. He's Welsh, a rugby player and a fireman. Could it get any dreamier? It was Jordan's idea that we had a bit of a list of, like, the things that you can't do whilst you're pregnant and on like a little mini bucket list and get them all over and done with this month. So we had like a cheese and wine night at the weekends and ate all the brie and drank all the wine. And now we're going to do some extreme sports. <laughs> so, so extreme. <laughs> looks like he did. Uh, this shouldn't seem scarier <laughs> than everything that we're going to do next week, but right now it really does. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any concerns about your relationship and surrogacy? Um, I think it, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's crossed my mind, like, how would the relationship stand up to surrogacy? So far, everything's been OK, and I don't foresee it going wrong. Other people assume that he wouldn't be OK with it. Did Caitlin kind of consult you about her choice to become Kate's surrogate? Yeah, she kept asking me how, I, how I'd feel about it. Um, but I suppose Caitlin's body, Caitlin's life, she can do what she wants, and if I don't like it, then it's my problem, really, isn't it? But, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't mind what she does, as, as long as she's happy. To be a surrogate, I think it's just a beautiful thing to do. I mean, I probably love her this much more. I didn't think it was possible, but... <laughs> At least I get to see what she's like when she's pregnant now, don't I? <laughs> so I live with her, I'll have a little inside of what she's like. I get, I get a free pass, if you will. <laughs> what about sex? That's the biggest problem, isn't it? She's taking medication out to make it more fertile, so any penetrative sex is out of the question, really, so I'm just down to all hands. <laughs> hands only. <laughs> I didn't think it would be as hard as, as hard as it would, but I'm bursting. So when does this bit end? Well, I'll have to ask Kate. <laughs> I'll have to ask someone else if I'm allowed to have sex with my girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> Kate and her partner, Matt, live half a mile away from Caitlin and have been together for 10 years. Having a family wasn't something that I've ever really thought about until I met Matt. He was the piece of the puzzle that made me think I found home and this is the person I want to have a family with. Even with all the shit we've been through, they still would choose him. Would you mind telling me what happened with your pregnancies? We've had um, one which we had to terminate because the little one was very poorly and that we found out at 20 weeks. Um, we had a stillbirth at 32 and a bit weeks and then I had a miscarriage at 13 and a half weeks. It sounds terrible, but the moment I had the miscarriage, I just felt relieved. And I said that to Matt. I said, I feel, I feel relieved that's over. I can't, I can't do that. Um, and I said, I think surrogates, surrogacy is what we've got to go for. And he was like, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Is there any reason why medically you couldn't have a pregnancy yourself? No. So um, if we decided we wanted to try again, the doctor said that there's no reason why we couldn't. Um, but I, I couldn't go through that again. And Matt as well, you know, he's had to watch me physically go through all of that without being able to help. Um, and I just don't think, I don't think it's, it's not right. I don't want to bring a child into the world with nine months of absolute sheer terror. I really don't. And when Caitlin said that she would do it for us, I think I actually just sat and cried. This is a whole new lot of emotions you start to open up a little bit again and to have a little bit of hope, and that's when you become vulnerable. It's not that I'm heartless or anything like that. I'm just... I feel a bit matter-of-fact about it all because that is the only way you can be. When your heart's been broken quite that badly, you just never, ever, ever put it back on the line. I wish I could have a baby with a woman. I'm very proud of who I am as a gay man, but the one thing that never sat easy with me was the fact that my sexuality was a barrier to me being a father. I'm single, I've got two cats, a bit of an animal lover. I like driving my convertible with the top down. I enjoy my job, I work as a teacher of the deaf. I'm happy with my situation in my life. What's missing is a son or daughter. And because I'm gay, I don't have access to a womb. I've thought about how to be a dad for many, many years. I've considered all the possible configurations, adoption, fostering, co-parenting. I've decided on surrogacy because my child needs to be a part of me. I need to have that 
genetic connection. David's plan is to create embryos using his sperm and donor eggs, then find a surrogate to grow one of them for him. Wash your hands and penis thoroughly with soap and water to prevent any infection entering the semen sample. Dry hands and penis with a fresh disposable towel. Semen sample should be produced by masturbation. Well, I don't know how else you might produce it down here. This is creation, or it's the start of creation, but also it's awkward. <laughs> so obviously this is all the um, stimulus. There seems to be lots of bits and bobs on display here. I don't really want to touch it, to be honest. I just have this absolute need to produce something from me, to grow a new person from part of what I am. I can't explain it. It's basically a biological imperative that many, many people have. In the lab, they will select the best sperm and inject it into the egg. Over the next five to six days, they will be cultivating the development of the embryo. Everyone deserves to be a parent if they want to be a parent. It might feel extreme because it's unusual, but I've never had another option. This is the only route I can take. With four embryos frozen, David is now searching for someone to carry his baby. It's such a massive unknown. I mean, will a surrogate ever want to work with me? I mean, who is this mystery woman that's going to come out of the shadows to offer to carry my child? How do I find her? What do I do? To help his quest, he signed up with an organisation that helps connect surrogates with intended parents. He's arranged to go to a Surrogacy UK social event in a week's time in the hope of meeting the woman who will help him become a dad. You make connections at these socials and it's one of the ways that surrogates decide who they want to get to know. From the intended parent side, you know, we really wouldn't be choosing this if we didn't have to. Whereas the surrogates are a bit more of a mystery for me, <laughs> you know. One in three, that's the ratio they have in the organisation, one surrogate to three intended parents. And at a social, it's even lower, so you're not going to get a one in three ratio of surrogates to intended parents. There is an element of competitiveness. I haven't quite worked out how I'm going to navigate that yet. I'll just try and be me, but a better version of myself. <laughs> So, my studio flat, and this is the main part of my living room. So this folds out into a sofa bed for me, and then you've got his little bedroom bit just through here as well. It's quite nice. So his own little wardrobe and his little cot. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> when I was younger, I imagined I'd have a big four-bed house with a lovely big garden, maybe some dogs. Probably three children, I thought, um, with my lovely husband, and that is not at all how it turned out. <laughs> uh, I live in a small little studio flat with my one son, no partner. Before I had Jacob, I was a engineer for an internet service provider. Do you have a train track? I was 20 when I fell pregnant with him. I'd been with Jacob's dad for about four years. We just kind of drifted apart when Jacob was about three months old and that's when we split. Suddenly I've got this very young baby and it's only me in its life as the primary carer. I didn't have a job, I thought I'm not even providing for my own family. I felt like I could be doing more, but I physically couldn't do any more to, to help him. I'm hoping in the future when I start working and I start getting a good income, we can actually afford a, a bigger place together, maybe a two bed, you know, somewhere with a garden, hopefully. I mean, it says on here for mine, um, it was to cover hostel parking, maternity clothing as well, life insurance. It's an absolute must in surrogacy. 
two days a week, he goes to the childminder. Obviously, Kevin Naki pay for that. My skin, this pregnancy, it's just been awful. So I said to Kevin Naki, would you mind if I spent some on, like, makeup and, like, toners and moisturisers and all these fancy skin creams? And they said, Emma, go for it. If you had your work credit card or whatever and you were going out and getting lunches with your clients and stuff, it's sort of the same as that. The client is, my, is the baby. My overall expenses are 7,600. I think I will have to ask Kevin Naki, sadly, for more, which is always awkward, but then we can't be expected to fund a pregnancy, essentially, that isn't ours. We're carrying, but it's not ours, if you know, if you know what I mean. What would you say to people that say that surrogates become surrogates for financial gain? Definitely not, I mean. You think about how much we go through during pregnancy and what we put our families through as well and our children. Do we risk death and illness and surgery? I thought to myself quite a few times, you know, I could die during this pregnancy or labour. There's no amount of money that um, <laughs> takes away that, that edge of being a surrogate. We definitely don't do it for the financial gain. In Alderney, Kate and Caitlin are preparing to fly to the mainland to a fertility clinic where Kate's embryo will be put into Caitlin's womb. This is probably the one thing that's made me feel a little bit nervous. Kate and Matt have done a fantastic job of producing the embryos, which we now know are totally perfect and good to go. But this feels like it's the only only element of all of it that rests solely on me. Can you go and get Mummy's toothbrush and toothpaste from the bathroom for me? Yeah. Thank you. We read online that apparently orange is the colour of fertility. So me and Kate will both be wearing lucky orange pants for every treatment, henceforth. Could you change your mind at this point, Caitlin? It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because I don't know how you could look someone in the face again if you changed your mind this far into a journey. We've joked about the, that I'd be on the run, but I honestly think I'd have to. I don't think we could continue working together. It'd be really, really difficult. Mummy? Yeah? That's all you need. Perfect. Thank you. Right, ready? Yes, sir. Good job. <laughs> As there are no fertility clinics in the Channel Islands, Kate and Caitlin have to fly 90 miles to Southampton for their embryo transfer. Now, I got you a tiny little present. No! I hope you like it. Ah, oh, it's orange! Believe in yourself and anything is possible. There you go. I feel bad. I didn't bet you a present. Well, it's OK. Um, you're not doing anything to my womb, so it's all good. Here we are. It's transfer day, obviously, which is why we're wearing orange. I think it's a really quick procedure. So the little straw goes in, and then the little embryo travels down there. And then Caitlin's going to do a really good job of hopefully holding on to it. But it's fine <laughs> if you don't. But please don't. <laughs> no pressure. Having Caitlin as our surrogate when I'm her boss is a bit of a strange setup, and I'm pretty sure I'd probably let Caitlin get away with a lot more than I would normally. When you go through this journey, you're putting all your trust in the surrogate, and part of that process has to be that you're handing over the power to them. You can do whatever you want today. You can, and you can just demand stuff from me. You can say, I want that bag I saw in Primark. Go and fetch it and bring it with full of McDonald's back to me, and I'll absolutely <laughs> do that. Okay. <laughs> Kate and Kate. Ooh. I'm good to go. Okay, let's go. <laughs> this is your uterus, and this is where we're heading with the embryo. Okay, so a little bit of pressure. I feel like the second the transfer happens, the stopwatch starts to see if it's going to have worked. All our hopes and dreams and everything is riding on Caitlin. You're 
okay? Yeah. Is that uncomfortable? Scratchy. We should be able to see the bright dot on the screen. It's coming now. That's the oh. tip of the embryo. Can you see that? So it's in. That's a little picture for you. Oh. <laughs> there we are. Are you worried that all your embryo is eating is takeaway food? No, she had an apple. Oh. Come back with all the food. <laughs> How has today gone? Today couldn't really have gone better, I guess. They were really happy with the quality of the embryo. It's gone all the way in. I've had to lie down a lot, which is nice. What do you think Kate's feeling? She's already asked me once today if I feel pregnant, which I just absolutely had to roll my eyes at. Um, but so, yeah, we've said once a day. <laughs> She's allowed to ask me questions like that once a day. Not thinking about the outcome, because I think when you've been through what Matt and I have been through, you absolutely don't look at the big picture. You don't get emotionally involved in it. Caitlin and I, we're very much like yin and yang, you know, we are really stressed and concerned and worried and stuff, and she's just very laid back and very positive. So I'm just going to work really hard at not winding her up when I'm really stressed about something. It's not going to change the outcome. I feel like this is in her hands now. David is traveling 80 miles to a surrogacy social event in the hopes that he'll meet a surrogate to carry his child. It's a time of high anxiety. <laughs> I think that's a big difficulty about doing things like this when you're single, that you don't have that immediate support network. surrogate can choose who she wants to talk to, ask what questions she wants to ask, make the decision whether she wants to get to know you more. As an intended parent, you have absolutely no power, no control. Surrogacy socials are held in function rooms across Britain every weekend of the year. At this one, 80 people have turned up. You're spending time travelling to carveries in random parts of the country and trying to find a surrogate and trying to navigate this thing. It really is like speed dating, and to that extent, it's slightly competitive. I think it helps because obviously you're a very good-looking couple, aren't you? So I think that's... That, yeah, I think that's part of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's great that you're building relationships with other intended parents, but ultimately they're not going to carry your child for you. Hello, how are you? Yes, Charlotte. Good, yes. yes, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Dave. Nice. Surrogates are really the showstoppers, aren't they? They walk on and the lights are on them and focus is on them. I kind of, I, you know, I work around children all day uh, as a teacher of the deaf and I feel it. Every fibre of my being is like, I need to be a dad, so it's like... If it was like a networking event at work, you are justified in being able to just go up to someone and give your pitch. But you can't do that as social. It's like your, your pitch has to be hidden amongst seven different layers of small talk, really. I guess if my parents had given me a dog when I was younger, I would be a dog person, but it was cats was the way to go. I don't want to be remembered at a social by a surrogate as someone who's elbowed, you know, four couples out of the way to get across the room to talk to her. And I don't want to be remembered as the person who turned up and said something really uninteresting and boring and was just desperate. It was a complete failure. I don't by any means think I'm anywhere closer to my goal. What does it mean when you don't get picked? Sometimes I feel that the narrative that's written around surrogacy is that the surrogate is the vulnerable one. So I understand that, you know, but I also think that it's the intended parents that we're the vulnerable ones. I don't, I don't know, well, maybe we're all vulnerable. Maybe we're just a bunch of vulnerable people trying to do something amazing and just doing the best we can to take care of each other. I don't know. Baby. 
baby. <gasps> Look. <laughs> Are you having a baby? Are you having a baby as well? <laughs> Is it a boy or a girl? Emma and her son Jacob are staying at Kevin and Aki's for the weekend. Tomorrow they have their 20-week scan, where they will find out the baby's gender. Five, four, three... Watching them with Jacob, it kind of gives me an insight as to what kind of parents they're going to be. They're brilliant with disciplining him, making him laugh, um, keeping him entertained. That's what a baby needs, is two lovely, calm parents at the end of the day. <laughs> I've only known them eight months now. It feels like a lot longer, though, because you're bonding over something so intimate and strange, I suppose, so quickly. You do get to know each other on such a personal basis. Three, four... I love them, honestly, they're brilliant. Five. Not too long and then their baby will be here and suddenly there'll be a lot more of us, <laughs> so they're exciting. Nine... One leg. Yeah, she's probably stretching out a little mm -hmm. foot at the end then. So arms and legs all good. See if we can come to the face. You see a little nose and mouth there. Oh, yeah. Little that pouty lips. Yeah, yeah, so. That's a nice selfie. <laughs> Before I met Kamanaki, I just felt very, very low. Living alone, dealing with Jacob as a single parent, it all kind of evolved from that. Even though I had my son, I didn't feel like I actually had much meaning. I didn't really want to continue with life. Trying to get a different angle. Building that connection with Kevin Naki and the realisation of actually what I could do for them as well, it's given my life like a whole new meaning. You've a beautiful face, look. Mm. <laughs> you know, from the moment we found out we were pregnant, even, you know, just seeing the happiness in their faces, I think that has kind of slowly healed me a little bit. Do you want to find out gender at all at this stage? Yes, please. Because I've got a good view. That's a girl. I can tell. So I've had a boy and I know what <laughs> looks very different. Yeah. Oh. That's a cutie. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite a nice feeling knowing that this pregnancy is a girl. It's funny because I thought, oh, would I be jealous of the fact they have a girl and I don't? But I'm just like, oh, OK, I get to watch someone else bring up a girl. Knowing it's my egg, it won't kind of be like, oh, that's my girl, because it's not my daughter. But I think because part of it's my genetics, if she does something very artsy or like nature and wildlife, I think, oh, that comes from me. Thank you. It's definitely like a lovely, warm feeling. <laughs> Emma's best friend, also called Emma, doesn't know any other surrogates and only recently found out her friend's plans. Oh, it's a baby in there, Emma. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, oh what about that here? Sometimes it does really hurt. Yeah. But oh, I remember when they stick there. Oh, she does that all the time. And... Yeah, and I'm like, right, pack it in. I'm going to tell your dad's on you. <laughs> Do you know what yeah. I mean? So it's like stuff like that. How are you feeling with your bump? It's strange. I still don't feel maternal towards her. Not like, oh, my baby, oh, God, I'm going to miss you so much. Like, no. Obviously, when the timing's right, when she's old enough, she understands genetics and all that kind of stuff, she will know that I'm biologically her, you know... Birth giver. Birth giver, <laughs> yes. Paternal <laughs> giver, you know. <laughs> yeah. So you don't say mum, do you? No, like, no, I'm not, not your mum. Mom. I spoke to Kevin Naki about the other day and I said, what am I going to be known as to her? And they said, you'll be tummy mummy. Tummy mummy. And I said, oh, that's oh, not, that's that's not so wrong. Cute. I think I'd want her to know growing up that, like, no matter where she lives or where I live, she can always call me because she's got two dads. If she needs that female connection or someone to talk to, it's like, hey, I'm here and I carried you, so I kind of know you, so like, it's OK. Do you think Kevin and Aki would be OK with you being that kind of female role modelish? I kind hope of in so. Her life? I don't want to sound like I'm imposing. It's just down to them completely, but as long as she knows that, she can talk to me if she wants to. Do you want to do some more over there? Yeah. These are primroses, aren't they? 
I hadn't noticed those before. David first told his parents about his dream to have a child through surrogacy three years ago. I didn't believe him at first. I thought it was Mother of David's <laughs> schemes. Bad idea. Of which he's had many in his <laughs> lifetime. And I thought you would actually come to your senses at some point, and then you didn't. Do you feel you can talk about it to your friends, or is it something that...? No, not... Well, I have... Because at some point, you will have yeah. to... I have... Um, if I do produce a baby, then yes. you, <laughs> you might have some questions as to where it's come from. I've, I've spoken to one of my friends a little bit about it, not a great deal, but a little bit, but I haven't said anything to anybody else. So I'm not ashamed of... It's not me, but I'm not ashamed of it at all. But I don't see the point of going into explanations with other people when, A, it might not come to anything, God forbid, um, I just wouldn't do it. Yeah. Have you talked about it, Dad, to your family? Like... No, I'm a very private person, so I, I wouldn't generally talk about those sort of issues. Your sister knows, obviously. Oh, yeah. But yeah, we haven't, yeah. haven't told yeah. anybody else really yet, but... Um, She's found it... Difficult. Difficult, yes. isn't she? Yes, she has. Yeah. Yes, she has. So, how do you feel knowing that my child won't have a mother? There's part of me that does say every child should have a mother. And why can't I be a mother? What does a mother have that I can't do? Sometimes when I go to the gym, I see all the young mums turn up with their little babies to go swimming or whatever they do. Right. David can and do that. I, <laughs> I try to sometimes envisage you in that group. And, and then they'll go off and talk about things that young mums talk about, and I don't know how you'd fit into all that, because oh, they, what, what they have is that support with each other, which that worries me with you. Lots of people would think there's something innate in motherhood that a man cannot provide. Now, I don't believe that, and I know you don't, but a lot of people do. It's about but nurture, to... not necessarily yeah, about think... what sex you are. Yes, absolutely. Or what role you're performing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it could well be. Yeah, definitely. What will be, will be, and you know we're here and we'll help I you know. all we can. I know. I really would love another grandchild. Yes, I know. <laughs> That's the other thing, isn't it? I know it is. I would love one. I think, do you remember that? He was about two then, wasn't he? I loved that little shirt he had on. Gosh, look, you've got hair. Oh, thank you. It's, oh, yeah, that was a me. Christmas yes. one. Wrestling with him. <laughs> what was David like as a little boy? He was the sweetest, most good-natured boy you could ever wish for. He was jolly, he was happy, wasn't he? Yeah. Up till he was 13. He was bullied at comprehensive school, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah he did. He went through a few years of when he was badly bullied. He was different. And then, of course, he was gay as well. He used to come and say he'd been hit by somebody, yeah. and I'd say, well, you would usually say, I would you? tell him to hit him back. Hit him but, back, um, and he won't. He wouldn't. He wouldn't he would do never it. do that. He would not do that. Secondary school was a complete unmitigated disaster for me. Almost instantly, I have memories of being bullied, like even in the first year. And that didn't really stop for the whole five years. It was just a car crash of abuse really, for me. Being attacked physically, being bullied verbally, being ignored. I think that was the worst of it, was when people would just avoid me and ignore me, stop talking when I walked in. I never really knew where the abuse was going to come from, so I learned to regard everyone as unsafe. And I can still feel that fear in me as an adult. I find it very hard to trust people. I'm always trying to think, what is it that they want from me? What is it that they're really thinking? What is it that they're getting at? It's this kind of perimeter check of where we're all at, you know? In terms of surrogacy, that's really problematic because you are so absolutely having to trust somebody to do the right thing by you. You're trusting somebody to grow your child, to look after your child for nine months, and you're trusting somebody to give you your child at the end of it. Emma is 32 weeks pregnant with Kevin and Aki's child. Hello. And today, they're having a baby shower. 
when meeting Kevin Aki's friends, you kind of think, I'm so excited for it, but actually, what if they don't like me? You, you kind of worry in case they kind of think, oh, they've picked her as a surrogate. Hello. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi. Hi, nice to meet you. This is from you. Me? Oh, thank you. What's this, Emma? Uh, these are gifts. This is a gift for me from the lovely Chi, and then this is a gift that I got from Kevin Aki. And did you expect to be given gifts to you? No, I didn't expect any gifts. I mean, I wouldn't have wanted any gifts for myself at the baby shower anyway. It's not about me, so it's about Kevin Aki, but um, it's very lovely that people have done that. It's really sweet. Nikki, that's beautiful. It's weird to be the one carrying the baby when it's not your own baby shower. But it is for them. It's a really weird scenario. I've never had to do that, obviously. Kevin Aki's friends are very different to my friends. They're in sort of late 30s to late 40s. They have high-paying jobs. They seem so confident in their life. My friends who have low salaries or no salary, like in my case, and it's just a very, very different audience, I suppose. It's not even like you can avoid the spotlight because it's literally all about this thing here. <laughs> Emma's got fantastic genes, she's very smart, she's beautiful and she's, she's just very warm. She's got so many lovely things about her and we just would be so blessed if our child inherits that from her. Delicious. Aki and I are always going to be looking out for ways that we can try to do something to, in part, repay. You never know for certain how life will play out, but we hope to continue to be very positive role models for Jacob and very good friends to Emma. Surrogacy is definitely emotionally risky. I've seen other surrogates and actually things haven't gone well between them and their intended parents. And um, you do worry if you think, oh, what if it does happen to me? If after the birth they dropped all contact and went away and I never got to see them or the baby again, I'd be very heartbroken. It's been two weeks since Kate's embryo was transferred into Caitlin's womb. Tomorrow, they plan to take a pregnancy test. Caitlin is going to do the first pee of the morning and then bring it in the office. Got the tests. Um, it's hard, you know, and also I'm very aware of how Caitlin's feeling, so I don't know if I should, if I need to be really enthusiastic for her. I just really hope she understands how, like, amazing it is what she's doing for us. Um, I've got a present, which I'm really excited about, because I know she really wanted it just here. I thought it might be quite a good hospital bag, so I really hope I haven't jinxed it with that. OK. <laughs> Shall I open it? Yeah. Do you want to do the dippy thing? No. You can dip. Do you want to press that green button and I hold that in there? I really don't want to knock it over. Oh, shake it. Good. I think it's enough. I really don't want to tip this over. It's really hard. 19, 20. Okay. I hope that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> it says pregnant. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, that's quite scary. In a good way, in a really, really good way. I <sighs> see, I feel like now it's more daunting than when I was pregnant because I feel like you've got this, like you're absolutely fine at this. You're actually going to have to look after this child very soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Finding out Caitlin's pregnant is a really big step forward in this hopefully having a positive outcome. But pregnancy, to me, doesn't definitely end with a live baby. I don't know what it's going to be like when she's sat there with my baby kicking around, but I guess, you know, much rather that than over here. <laughs>《Someone um, who I've been chatting to and she's just messaging me so that's what's popping up her messages. 
She's been a surrogate before in the past, and she found me on the boards, and she just popped me a couple of messages saying, oh, you know, that was really funny what you said. We've just got a little back and forth, and it's just making me laugh, some of the things she's saying. <laughs> I've got her into gifts now, because I said I like, I'm a bit of a gifter. I like gifts, so she said she didn't ever used to send gifts, and now she's sending me gifts. So bizarre, I've never felt this way for a woman before. <laughs> David has agreed to meet Lauren at a surrogacy social in Woking. I don't know what's going to happen. I think we're just building a friendship at the moment, but obviously there's a certain element of excitement in me and, and anxiety and, you know, she obviously wants to get to know me on a personal level. I often wonder, actually, you know, knowing how badly I want to be a dad. How much like a monkey would I dance? How do you separate it from talking to a friend to talking to a potential woman who's going to carry your child? <laughs> I recognise the face, so I thought I'd follow him. Nice to meet you. You're nice right. Meet you. Hello, Ted. Ready, steady, go. There we go. <laughs> I've never been someone who really believes that you have to have a, a mother figure and you have to have a father figure and that's the only thing that you can do to bring up a child. Yeah. I've always thought in terms of my relationship with the surrogate, it's an adult woman who has cared for them and has been instrumental in yeah. Yeah. bringing them And, I, and I, that's, so what, I, that that's what I want to be able to be to that child, like, not a mother, but, like, I gave birth to you, like, yeah. like you're a family because we were a team. An influence, some kind of influence. Yeah. The fear I've got is that she doesn't want to get to know me, so that's the fear. Never been this nervous around a woman before. <laughs> Hold it together. Do you need to hand with anything? <laughs> no, it's fine. It's David will have to wait to find out if Lauren wants to have his baby. As under surrogacy UK rules, a surrogate can't directly make an offer. She has to go through the organisation. So you're definitely, you're thinking that you want to do, at some point in the near future, another journey? Yeah. Yeah. OK. OK. All right, well, I'll speak to you soon. Yeah. Bye, Lauren. Thank you. I've got this, like, feeling in my stomach, this kind of curdling, like, happiness and anxiety at the same time. Um, is it like when you ask someone to marry you and you're in that, like, tiny moment where you're not sure whether they're going to say yes or no, because that yes is, is going to change your world and that no is going to be the pits of rejection? So today is my due date. We actually got granted the other day a home birth. So I'm like, right, so I've actually had to buy a paddling pool from Argos that I know is going to be deep enough to sort of support me during labour. Um, get that, get some tarpaulin, like some old shower curtains, just like waterproof surfaces basically to go in the flat because I have a beige carpet. I actually think I've got a contraction or something coming on right now. Um, yeah, sorry, that really hurts. <laughs> so we're on the way to Emma now, and you can see the road ahead of us is very clear. In the back of the car, we've got the uh, our daughter's car seat. We've got some other bits, including some towels and some tarpaulin. In my seen labour. Waiting for the next contraction. <laughs> Surrogacy is a huge thing to do. I didn't feel like it was when I first started, and actually suddenly now I'm about to give birth, it's actually like, oh no, I've done a huge thing. <laughs> Try and breathe if you can.
Have we checked that she's definitely a girl? Yeah. She's oh, definitely, definitely a girl. A girl. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Very dark hair. She is. She's more head than Jacob. <laughs> Straight through and right into the There we go. One okay. go. There we go. Hey! Right, so is she coming to you? You're going to go to Papa. You OK, Emma? We'll get you moved around in a second. Just swap this out for this nice dry one. Ooh. I've had a lot of people say, how do you carry the baby for so long? And then ultimately, like, give it up at the end. But it's kind of explained to people it's not giving up a baby. It was always for its intended parents. You're just giving it back in a way. Emma, she's gorgeous. She's, she's gorgeous. <laughs> there we go. You've realised actually you've created a family and you've created family and you have created parents and grandparents and aunties and uncles and you realise what, what a huge thing it is you've actually done. <laughs> I do get a lovely, warm, fuzzy feeling when I think of the future of Kevin Naki, um, and it's something I'm very excited for. So, uh, today um, I got uh, a message uh, on Facebook from one of the admins of Surrogacy UK. Yeah, you had to think about it. I didn't want to just make the decision not on the spot. They say that a surrogate has expressed interest in, in getting to know you, and, and that surrogate is Lauren. Yeah, I just clicked with him. He's just really relatable. And she has said that she wants to get to know me. He's just so lovable, and he's got so much love to give. Yeah, really, I'm just really, really glad. He's ready, and he really wants this. The, the vibes were, were there, and I was picking up on the right things. It is kind of like love at first sight, but like not quite, because like you're not quite, you're trying to get into a relationship, but not the standard relationship. Stress is very, very dangerous in a pregnancy. I'm worried about the baby at the moment. There's quite a lot of putting a brave face on. <laughs> I never thought I'd uh, be in this position where I'm actually saying no to a surrogate. And I don't even know if I'm going to find one again. Hello. Hey, 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 hey. Just a shout, I guess. <laughs> what have you got now? <laughs> find out more about the world of surrogacy and listen to an Open University podcast exploring prenatal testing and surrogacy. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash surrogates and follow the links to the Open University. Thank you.